I think it's right to say leaders are either made or broken based on the decisions that they make along their way. Few people notice a slight change that I made. Uh, I will I will tell you guys why I made that change when I am uh, into that that section. So basically, this session is split into two uh, two sections, which is smart decision making is one and managing. So they are not very interrelated, but uh, but there are some you know some overlapping areas. Uh, so what is the need for smart decision making, right? So first of all, why is decision making important? Uh, all of you are in the audience are uh, some form in, a, uh, in some form of a leadership position or, or in managerial position. Uh, why do you think uh, decision making is so important? You are yourself today because of the decisions that you have taken in the past, right? Uh, I think it's right to say leaders are either made or broken based on the decisions that they make along their way. Uh, so in your professional career, uh, especially as a leader, I'm, I'm talking uh, talking to you as leaders, not as pure managers. As leaders and even as managers, you are required to make decisions on behalf of your subordinates, so on behalf of the organization most of the time. Right? Therefore, it's very important that you think of this decision making a little more seriously. Uh, like, like, in the, uh, like, like the slide says, leaders are made or broken based on the decision that you make. So approach decision making as a process, not as an event. Just don't think, it, think of decision making as just some, some event that you like you know, to, you know, to get through. So in order for you to make smarter choices, smarter decisions, I'll point out some decision making traps that you will uh, encounter along the way. Some are emotional traps, some are like cognitive kind of traps. First one, the anchoring trap. How many of you have heard of this anchoring trap? Right. Uh, uh, let's, let's, let me take a quick example, right? Let's take Bhutan, the country, right? Uh, their land area is roughly, the, roughly about half of the size of Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka's population is around, let's say, 21 million. Uh, if I ask you the question, so like I mentioned, Bhutan is uh, their landmass is about half of Sri Lanka, right? Uh, Sri Lankan population is 21 million. If I ask you the question, is Bhutan's population is around, uh, let's say, uh, above 10 million or be, uh, below 10 million? Can someone take a chance, Asiri? About 10 million or below? About 10 million, but I don't know. Yeah, about 10 million. All right. Anybody else? Below. Below? All right. But I ask you, take a guess. Yeah. Well, take a, give me a number, just guess about the, the population of Bhutan. Inside, say it is about 30 million. Or the, uh, 30 million? 30 million? Let's say, let's say dirt, shows 5 million. But how much? <laughs> 5.8 million. It's close. I think it's close. Anybody needs to take a guess? Like 32 million. How much? 32. 32 million. Right, okay. Um, in, in reality, in actuality, the, the population of Bhutan is about 700,000 or close to 800,000. What? <laughs> right, so the Maldives. The Maldives is uh, It's like 500,000. So I mean, uh, wow. so what, what I did there was I anchored you to something, right? I anchored you to 10 million, right? So in your day-to-day -day life, when you are working through, let's say, estimates, like forecasts, uh, any, with any numbers, right? You, you some, inadvertently, you anchor yourself to certain uh, numbers. So here, you just got carried away with the 10 million, right? So whereas the actual number is far less. Uh, so that is called the anchoring trap, right? So you can use it to your advantage as well, right? 
So when you are like negotiating, you know, uh, negotiating things, the uh, price of a land, the price of something. So you, you, if you be mindful about this trap, you can play, you can make use of this trap to your advantage. At the same time, uh, some people can take advantage of you as well. Unless you be mindful about that, uh, you will get caught in this, in this trap. Second is the sunk cost fallacy. Uh, sunk cost is, a, is, a, is, an, is an economic term, right? So, say you invest on something, it's not giving its returns, and therefore it's, it's no point in like, yeah, like sustaining that or incurring that same uh, cost uh, going forward. You, you rather like, you know, write off that uh, as, a, as a sunk cost, right? Rather what happens is, so when you make an investment or on, let's say, some tool, some programming language or a solution, um, or, or on a, even a person, right? So you, maybe you, you recruit, recruited someone, but you are not getting the, the return, or you are not getting the, the desired outcome from that individual, or from that solution, or, so, or from that tool, right? Uh, but you emotionally, you are attached to that. You have made this recruitment. You have built this solution. You have built this, you know, product. So you are emotionally attached. Right? So, but it's not giving the returns that that you. Expect, so, but you keep on like investing more. You are throwing more and more people. You are giving more and more training to that individual, trying to like fix him. But 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 in reality you can't. So these are some costs, right? Uh, this is a trap. Uh, so for a uh, untrained leader uh, manager, they get caught in this trap. Uh, it, it, uh, the damage will. Uh, may have done already, but by the time that they realize that, uh, that uh, this is some cost. So, uh, so be mindful about this and try to like uh, write off such some some costs as some costs, so you can get rid of uh, you can avoid uh, further damage. The third is a status quo bias. Right? Uh, I'm pretty sure you have heard this statement. Let's not rock the boat too much at this point. Right? That that's a that's a good telltale sign of status quo, right? Uh, you are comfortable in the status you are in right now, right? So you, you, you don't like to make changes, right? It's, it's uncomfortable, right? So that's the least part of resistance, right? So which is which is uh, dangerous, right? Because it will not give you the desired outcomes. It's, uh, like the sun cost, right? This status quo bias will accumulate. Uh, under your, you know, portfolio. Uh, an example would be, let's say you inherit the land in some, let's say, far away, some, like uh, place, uh, but you are not selling them. But, but if you, if someone, uh, but you, I mean, in reality, you, if you had the money, you will never go to that far away place and like buy, buy a land over there. But, but you are not. But due to this status quo bias, you are comfortable with what you have, so you are not even like thinking of selling it. It's just, just are just hanging into it. So similarly, so in, in the workplaces you have similar biases. Uh, so I mean, if you think about it, I mean maybe again uh, uh, things that you are already handed over, inherited from from your predecessors. Maybe you took over a new division, but there are a lot of you know um, status quo. There's a status quo in that that division with so many solutions and stuff like that. Uh, be mindful about this this trap. The fourth is a confirming evidence trap. You, you, you are, now you are faced, you are, you are required to make a decision, but you are biased towards certain, uh, uh, certain let's say, solutions, ways and means of doing things. Therefore, when you look for evidence, when you do research, you look, you look to uh, find confirming evidence uh, to back your ideology. You are not opening your mind. You are just finding evidence to confirm your uh, school of thought, maybe, right? So this is another trap. Right? So you have to broaden your like uh, mind, open your uh, mind for all to alternatives. You need to truly research, right? You need to uh, uh, to look beyond the, the your your comfort zone and and uh, and and do the research properly. And the framing trap. Often the leaders uh, are at fault of this. They frame the idea incorrectly. 
So when you frame the idea incorrectly, you give you give incorrect reference points for your subordinates, right? So so that sort of acts as an anchor itself. Uh, so be careful when you like uh, uh, explain a problem statement or, or a request for a solution. Uh, you have to like uh, pick the right frame. So you have to do a good job at like framing the problem. Right? And there are a number of estimating and forecasting traps. This is very applicable for you guys because most of you are, uh, are dealing with some form of like you know estimation and uh, forecasting, uh, maybe for your projects. Over, uh, under this, you you find overconfidence, right? So often there are a lot of uh, estimates that are like over optimistic. Or on the other end, you are very overly cautious, uh, over prudent, uh, as they say. So those are like two ends, two, two extreme ends in the, in the, in the, in the same spectrum. And then uh, we have something called recallability bias. So let's say if there was a strategy, let's say you know, from project point of view, if there was like a tragic incident, maybe a code red situation or something like that, so which affects your decision making uh, or, or estimating in this uh, in this exercise, right? It's called the recallability. You can recall a very tragic ex uh, like a circumstance which affects, influences your uh, estimates or forecasts. So what can you do before making that big decision? So now that you understand few traps uh, in decision making that you can that you can encounter, you can enforce few uh, decision making the decision quality control measures, few checks and balances just to make sure that you yeah, that you are making the right decision given the context that is. These are some questions that you can ask yourself. If you are the decision maker, these are the, these are few questions that you can ask yourself. Are there any motivated errors? Is the recommender trying to deceive deceive you? So as a leader, I, I, I actually, we, I am mind, mind, mindful about that. Uh, maybe these are inadvertent uh, uh, errors, but it could be like uh, deceptions. Uh, when someone is recommending something for me, where I have to make the final decision, have the fo recommenders fallen in love with the, pro the with the proposal? But, I mean, some come and say, "Okay, look, Kiran, this is amazing. This, 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 this is the this, this is the way to go, right?" Uh, so you have to be very careful as to see whether these these, these proposed these recommenders have fallen in love with that because. The moment that they fall in love with that, what they are recommending, maybe they are, you know, they are susceptible for the confirmation bias, um, or they are like settling for the status quo, where they are in their in their in their relevant whatever uh, comfort areas, and carefully look at the group who's recommending this solution. If it's a, like a, a, a meeting kind of setup carefully look at whether there are there are any dissenting opinions like there are any, uh, anybody who's like you know even from a body language point of view who are not very comfortable with what, the, what their leader is proposing uh, those are very important right so usually in in, uh, in people recommend solutions they they are subject to something called the group think I'm pretty sure most of you have heard of that it's called, it's, uh, it's also about sham unity right so of course, you have dissenting opinion among yourself, but when you come, come to me or some, some other manager or leader and propose that, uh, you will say, okay, we are, we are, we are united, we, we recommend this as a team, but whereas not, right? Uh, but therefore, carefully look at those who, individuals that, you, that, that are like, you know, showing dissenting um, opinions or, uh, or like uh, uh, showing um, some form of resistance or, or concerned about this, so you can uh, so you can talk to them. Maybe take a break and talk to them, and then find try try to find out uh, uh, try to approach them informally and try to get 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 their point of view uh, outside of the, the team. Some more questions to be asked from the team. That if there's a team recommending a solution. Uh, or a proposal, so you can ask these questions from the team. Check whether these these recommendations are based on salient uh, analogies. 
So often they, uh, these recommend uh, these proposals are made based on analogies. They say, okay, okay, this is a similar solution to what we did in the past. Likewise, make sure as a, as a leader, make sure that their their chosen analogy is right. Because if they choose the wrong kind of analogy, they'll go down the wrong path. Have they looked at credible low alternatives? That this is very, very important. Right? Uh, they should look at at least multiple alternatives before they, they conclude on, on a recommendation. And if they have looked at alternatives, uh, find out at which point they have excluded those alternatives over what they are recommending. That is very important. Sometimes, due to the to the love of, a, let's say, a, a, let's say a technology or a, or a, a methodology or some, some form of thing, they get carried away. So therefore, it's, as as a leader, it's, it's your duty to to inquire about the alternatives that they uh, evaluate and find out at which point that they excluded and what are the reasoning behind that behind that. Also, you can ask if, you, if, if the team is to make this decision in a year's time, what additional information they would require. This is again linked to the confirmation bias, right? Because what you see is all there is. So if you, if you Google, Google, Google search or something like that, you are presented with a list of whatever, let's say journals or other case studies or whatever. So you are limited to that, that, that knowledge, right? Uh, but get your team to critically think uh, what actually is needed. Are we missing some piece of information in order for us to like confidently uh, conclude this this choice, this decision, decision? And ask from where the numbers came from. Often you see numbers, figures. Find out whether these numbers are actual facts or like forecasts. Because that, that, may, that makes a world of a difference, right? Facts and estimates, those are two different things. And certain individuals have this say, halo effect, right? Those who are very successful, it could be engineers, uh, it could be some, some technical leads, some groups, some pods, some divisions, they, they have this halo effect, right? So anything that, that, uh, that they recommend, they, I mean, people think of it because they have like, scored f several successes, uh, and the, the people think, okay, should be good. This new recommendation, that what their their approach should be good, right? Which is wrong. It, nothing should be like uh, be be nothing should be taken for granted. Everything should be like questioned and and uh, make sure that uh, the, they follow a certain method of like a process. Uh, a method uh, they, they came to the the decision through a method methodical approach. Are the recommenders overly attached to the past decisions? Somewhat closely goes with the sum costs, right? Maybe your your decisions that you come up with right now are <coughs> your past, you know, past decisions. You have some emotional attachment to your past decisions. Is the base case overly optimistic? Again, over, we are talking about overconfidence, and often these, uh, I say. Uh, Often we come, come, uh, come up with worst case scenarios, right? We, we try to plan for the worst case scenario. But, but I mean, if you, if you critically look at it, these worst case scenarios are actually not first enough. Right? So we are just fooling around, right? I mean, what's, so you have to like critically think and come up with the, the true, what, what could be the truly true worst case scenario. All right, how can we change the culture of indecision? Uh, think of this scenario, right? So there's a leader in, let's think of a meeting setup. There's a leader who's a, who's a very senior person in the room. There's a bunch of, uh, let's say, engineers. And, um, and these engineers are like, presenting uh, a proposal, <coughs> a recommendation, right? So you recommend you, they finish the, the their proposal, and now it's time to like discuss and debate, right? But there's absolute silence. Everybody's waiting for to get a clue from the leader whether it's yay or nay for the pro proposed solution. 
that is that is a culture of indecision, right? So, so it's actually the leader is at, at the fault of that. So the, because the leader is responsible to create a culture which is open and and, and, and it's it, that everybody can like open up. So how, how how can we break such a culture and like uh, yeah how can we break such a culture? First of all, you need to develop a, like a culture a culture of intellectual honesty. Anybody should be able to like express their opinions uh, into in a, you know, in a forum. There should be honest dialogues in all all settings. It could be meetings, PR reviews, any setting. And you need to reward to provide feedback and follow through. Feedback and follow through is very very important. And discourage those teammates and members who block execution. And uh, you need to coach them as leaders. So what can a leader do in order to like uh, cultivate that kind of a, like a decisive culture? First, the leader must listen, and he or she should initiate a dialogue with the forum. Have you seen a situation where uh, the, the, the team, the, the, the team member, a team member makes a proposal? Maybe he or she says something like uh, stupid, and there's a heavy barrage of full, like frontal assault from the leader, and you, and that's it, right? So you go, you go, go back to your base and you come up with another day uh, uh, for a meeting and pro propose it again right that's very bad right so if you if you have like a, a very hostile uh, like a culture you are not gonna uh, create a context or setup where your members team members open up check whether alternatives have been considered so when, when in, in a meeting kind of setup always the leader has the responsibility to inquire into whether alternatives have been uh, evaluated or considered. Learn the fine art of asking right, the right question. This is, this, is a, this is like the superpower of all the, all the leads, leaders, I would say. So over time, through experience, they, they know exactly what to ask at the, at the, in, 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 given, in a given uh, situation. So this is, a, this, is a, you know, this is a skill that you need to acquire you need to, uh, over time. Coach the, your teams through questioning. Feel free to be blunt, but no, uh, not angrily or unkindly. Don't try to demean uh, the, the, the team members. Uh, because I mean, if, if you demean, I mean, rest assured, they will not open up or they, will, they won't speak up uh, the next time. And uh, it's very important that, that you point up, point gaps in their thought. So, so if the proposal is not acceptable, you need to like, uh, like tell, uh, tell them in such a way that these are the caps and these are the things that they need to work on. And these are the alternatives that they need to uh, to evaluate, and you go come back and make another pres uh, presentation proposal. So here I mentioned the importance of initiate, initiating a dialogue. But there are few dialogue killers. Uh, importantly, you, in a meeting, uh, at the end of a meeting, you need to get the meeting to a closure. Who does and who does what and when? So you need to have some concrete action plan. Otherwise, this, uh, these meetings are not going anywhere. No decision will be taken at the end of a meeting. Clogged information. Often, I've seen meetings that don't go anywhere, right? I mean, they fail to uh, gather the relevant relevant information, uh, and they just reconvene to another time. Right? That is because you haven't like uh, gotten the right people in the on board, or you haven't made the expectations clear, uh, or there are people who are hoarding information. Remember, there are there are sometimes people who, who hoard information for for their personal I don't know um, gain or interests. Uh, so you need to, as a leader, you need to sanction those those who brought uh, information, or and uh, at the same time you need to coach them. 
and some have a, like a peace being kind of perspective, right? So they are self-interested people. They have narrow points of view. Then they try to dive into the. To, to, they, they they just focus on only on their point of view. They are they are not like listening to what what the forum says. So as as a leader, you need to be aware of all these like uh, different like characters, and you need to as a leader, you need to govern the the, the free flow of of the discussion of any decision making activity. There are extortionists who take everyone for for ransom for uh, in a meeting, right? And there are side trackers who are like go in tangents. They'll say, okay, in my time I was doing this like this. Ten years ago I was uh, doing like this. Like, I mean, if I were you, I would like do like this, like this, right? Uh, and and most dangerously, there are silent lies. Have you seen those people that you don't in meetings that are like? <laughs> Right? So those are silent lines, right? So actually, th those are the, the, the most dangerous people. The reason is they are not expressing their true opinion, right? Sometimes they are nodding their head for things that they are agreeing for things that they are not going to execute, right? So that's very dangerous. So as a leader, you need to, to carefully like observe and and just and, and sanction those uh, behaviors. <coughs> Therefore, in order for you to do that, a leader must have inner strength. A leader must need to speak up. So you need to like uh, uh, change the behavior of, of, of these group settings. Otherwise, what happens is uh, you cannot create a uh, decisive culture. So how this dialogue becomes action? Remember, the setting that this dialogue happens is as important as, uh, as the dialogue itself. Uh, so you need to ca carefully choreograph uh, what, what this setting is, right? There are a few characteristics of uh, decisive cultures. Openness, the outcome should not be pre predetermined, right? If the outcome is predetermined, nobody will open up, right? Nobody will even like care to speak up or give their opinion. Kendo, Kendo means uh, the, the, that decision making activity that that forum in that forum anybody should be able to like speak the unspeakable informality because the formality inhibits the candor uh, any candid agreement uh, any candid conversation otherwise if, if it's so formal it, it's like it's like the, the, the whole meeting is like a script, scripted um, arrangement if so nobody will open up right and uh, last but not least, the closure. It's very important for a leader uh, to close, to bring the, 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 the conversation or the decision making activity to a closure. Without that, that's, that's where, the, the, that's what tests the strength of a leader. Right? So, so often, I mean, you have a, like a discussion, you have like an open forum, brainstorming happens, but a leader must, some most of the time, to take a, take a final call. So this is actually, truly test the, the, the strength of our leader. All right. So that concludes the first portion of my presentation, which is about smart decision making. Any questions with, uh, with regards to that section before I jump into the next section? All right. Managing oneself. Earlier, this was titled Managing Your Career. Yep. I felt that it was a little too cheesy. Cheesy in the sense, I mean, if you, if you, if you go through your timelines, maybe Twitter, maybe your Facebook, uh, just tap into your newsletters, uh, your, your inboxes, there are so, so much self-help guides telling you what to do, uh, how to improve your productivity, and this is how Elon Musk does, and this is how Mark Zuckerberg does, and this is how much sleep that this guy gets. So much information, which is amazing, which is great, right? And you guys read books, right? Most of you, uh, I believe, right? Maybe you have read about biographies of great people, right? Lee Kuan, the kinds of Lee Kuan News. Um, I'm, you guys have uh, Steve Jobs. <laughs> uh, are, I'm pretty sure you guys have like, looked at these great personalities. And some of you might, might have been following 
these in characters like these, like, you know, larger than life characters for a long time. But I'm not seeing any Elon Musk here. I, I don't see people taking decisions like Lee Kuan Yew. Um, I don't see product innovation happening like Steve Jobs. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you have gained some, some influence from these people. Uh, you have learned, you have brought your perspective. But I, have, but, but, I, but I don't believe that it has made a significant alteration to, to who you are. Right? But I'm going to talk about it will slightly demotivate some people. Um, you will understand why. Uh, but uh, in, in my personal belief, I think uh, what I'm going to cover is actually focusing a lot on uh, the core you. Right? I'm shamelessly uh, borrowing the concepts from this gentleman, Peter Drucker. If you have done, let's say, an MBA or some management uh, program, uh, this name is very, very common. He's, he's, one of the, he's an Austrian born um, educationist uh, and he's a management consultant, he's a, he's a renowned management consultant. Uh, he has uh, he has come up with so many so many great concepts uh, over 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 his career. Managing uh, oneself is, is a seminal article and, and, and which was converted to a book by, by this gentleman. I came across this somewhere in 2004, 2005, and I fell in love with this. Uh, this is a no-nonsense guide to how you can uh, evaluate yourself and like identify your true strength. I often uh, refer to this uh, time and again. So I thought, I think this is the great, oh, this is a great opportunity for, for me to like present what I have learned from this uh, to you guys. So, we live in an un un unprecedented age, right? I mean, the opportunities are endless. Uh, if you have the ambition, if you are ambitious, if you are smart, your your opportunities are endless. Ambition and smartness, right? The opportunities are endless. A, a career, when you say a career, usually spans some 50 years. Let's say you start a career at 20, you go all the way to let's say 50. Uh, so roughly about 50 years. Uh, but as you go higher up in your your ladder in, uh, in your career or, or chosen profession, you are presented with uh, opportunity after opportunity. Those opportunities come with a lot of responsibilities. Don't think, don't delegate your career, what do you call, um, uh, to, don't delegate your management of your career to your organization. Nobody can, nobody can do it. Pe pe this gentleman says so. I'm just re re uh, replicating what, what he's just what he preaches. You are, you you have to act as your own CEO, right? So you need to take those critical decisions. You need to do your uh, critical assessment of of your strengths, your weaknesses, and then only you can like uh, cause a path for your career. How can you do that? You need to, to cultivate a deep understanding about yourself. Uh, not about Elon, not about Steve Jobs, because what worked for them, Mr. Shodan, mean, it will not work for you. You will get to know why. Not only your strengths and weaknesses are, uh, you, uh, you need to identify not only your strengths and weaknesses are, but how you learn, how you work with others, your values, and where you can make the greatest contribution. Because, see the underlined statement, only when you operate on strengths, you can achieve the, the true excellence. And you, you know, if I have to summarize uh, the, this presentation, this part of the presentation, I mean that's that's the statement, right? So you need to play to your strengths. Right? So your strengths are unique to you. There's there's no chance you can like transform yourself by reading a autobiography or or, or other like you know um, some some profile unless you do, uh, focus on new, your, your strengths. If you look at all, history's, all, uh, history's greatest achievers, uh, all of them have taken care of managing their careers. So, 
Peter Drucker gives seven, uh, it's like a uh, seven point framework. The last one I'm not going to cover. The reason is, I mean, it's not, you, most of the, almost all of us are uh, uh, young uh, in age. So the, the seventh one is, is actually for those who are like going through the, the, the last stages of their career, the second half of their career, right? So when I say a 50 year career, uh, so those who are like beyond the, the 25 years or so 30 years of experience can look at that. That's more work for you. So I will not tell, dive into that. So I will focus on these six, uh, six elements. What are my strengths? How do I perform? What are my values? Where do I belong? And what should I contribute? And taking the, the responsibility for relationships. I know it sounds a little too cheesy, but stick with me. <coughs> what are my strengths? Peter Drucker says to a feedback analysis, which spans at least two to three years. A feedback analysis is, is, is not a rocket science, right? I mean, it's just simple feedback analysis. You, you analyze all the key decisions that you take in your life, in your, in your career, and uh, you, you first, first of all, you plan. You, 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 write, you, you jot, jot down the key decision that you are making, and you jot down the key outcome that you are like, like to see. And circle back in another nine to twelve months and see where you stand, whether you have achieved or whether you have not achieved, and uh, and identify your strengths and identify your weaknesses. Identify first of all, focus on your strengths. Put yourself where your strengths are. Second, work on improving the strengths. So try to supplement your strengths as much as possible. If you see small small gaps in your in your strong areas, fill those gaps. If you feel like you can supplement or complement certain like uh, your, your existing strength by learning new new things, new new skills, competencies, develop that. Focus on your strengths. Third, discover where your intellectual arrogance is. This is a problem. Uh, uh, I've seen uh, a lot of problems with engineers, with first rate engineers. They, uh, they feel pride in not knowing, let's say, about people. Right? So, so the first rate engineers, they, are, they, they, they think, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm technically like, superior, therefore, therefore I don't need to, to understand people. Right? Uh, taking, taking pride uh, on their ignorance is, is self-defeating. Uh, so you need to go acquire those necessary skills in order for you to like, that extra mile or realize your full potential and this feedback analysis will show you uh, any bad habits maybe you are a chronic procrast procrastinator uh, maybe the lack of manners maybe you are maybe you're brilliant maybe you are, from an engineering point of view you are brilliant you have, you have the greatest degree maybe you have uh, so much experience uh, but in this analysis you realize Okay, I, I have put down this. I have taken this decision. And I have expected this outcome, but I haven't. I have not reached it. Probably, maybe you are, you are such a jerk, right? There are so many brilliant jerks, right? Um, thank you. <laughs> so, so you have to have the, the uh, like you know manners, professionalism, right? Because those maybe. Resources, those are the, like the, the inhibitors in your, in your, in your career, right? So focus on those, just you know, improve on those. So the reason why uh, Peter Drucker is asking us to focus on these, uh, these trends is because if you, if you try to build competencies in, 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 a, in, in an area where you have no or low competency, you will end up as a mediocre person. But if you if you are a frustrated if you are a frustrated performer in a, in a certain area, and if you and that's your strong, strong area, if you enhance that further, you will end up as an excellent um, performer. So the, the message is play to your and your employees' strength. Often I have seen that uh, some of these these uh, budding leaders come and say. My, my team is not as great as I am. 
So these, these guys are not delivering, right? So these are these guys are failing. These guys are failing miserably. Uh, so I need I need to like train them. So, but as a bodybuilder, you need to identify what their strengths. They are individuals themselves. They have their own strengths and weaknesses. So you need to play to their strengths. Because if you go train them on, on their weakness area, what happens is this. You create someone mediocre. Right? You will not get what you like, you know, uh, expect from them. Number two, assess how do, you, how do I perform. Am I a reader or a listener? Right. So Peter Drucker, in his uh, article, tried to differentiate between these two uh, personalities: reader and the listener. Uh, just to put it into context, a reader is someone who, like you know, learns through reading of books or articles and reports and stuff like that. Whereas a listener is is more uh, more of a person that goes to lectures and take notes there and stuff like that. Uh, so those are different personalities altogether. Uh, I am a reader myself, I, I believe. I am not much of a listener. Uh, a quick tip, if you try to manage, let's say if you are a reader, if I go, go and try to manage my boss or interact with my boss, treating him as same as I am, as a reader, I will fail. Right? Because my boss's way of learning or working may be different. So it's very important to identify whether you are a reader or a listener. Right? How do I learn? So that's somewhat interrelated to what I just mentioned. Do I work well with people or am I just alone? Right? So these are these are hard facts, right? I mean these are I mean if you look at yourself, I mean you you'll, you'll figure out. Sometimes you are a team player, sometimes you are not. That's a, that's a that's a fact. How do I perform under under stress? Do I fit in a small or larger organization? If it's a large organization, let's rest assured that there's bureaucracy, there are different hierarchies, management, protocols, um, things like that. Right? So, is it compatible with your uh, performance? So we we just think about that. Are you a team member or, or are you showing signs of a coach or a mentor? And avoid what you perform poorly. Like I said, play to your strengths. Do not try to change yourself. You are unlikely to succeed. See, but I said I'm, I'm kind of demotivating you guys, right? So, but this, <laughs> this is this is kind of the, the, the reality, right? Find out what are your values. What are my values? Drucker says do something called the mirror, called a mirror test. Go in front of your, go in front of the mirror and and try to. Uh, in, when you are in front of the mirror, what kind of a person you would like to see? A fraud or a, or a non unethical person? Uh, or a leader, a confident person? Likewise, and, I, and at the same time identify the values that you want to see in, 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 the, in, the, in the mirror. For example, if, 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 if your personal values are not in compared if your values are not compatible with the organization, that's not a good marriage. Right? Because you are continu continuing to like struggle adjusting to the organization. Uh, at the same time, the organization is also like trying to adjust to your values. For example, an organization might have like a, sometimes a short-term vision, right? whereas you will have like a you know, grand vision. You, you are like a long-term um, strategist. You have long-term goals. Therefore, you, you prefer uh, that kind of an approach. Fourth one, where do I belong? A small number of people will figure out where they will end up in their career by the, by the time, by, by, by age four or five. Like mathematicians, musicians, chefs, they'll figure it out, right? And even at that small age. Few people will, people like uh, physicians, they'll decide on that career path by the time they reach their teenage years. But most people, the, especially those who are highly gifted, they, they only figure this out in their mid-twenties maybe. By then, that those individuals should be well aware about the three qualities that I, three characteristics that I mentioned. The strengths, what are their strengths, how do they perform, and what are my values. 
based on that only you should like choose a path uh, in, a, in a particular career. If you are not a good decision maker, by the time you are like say in your 20s, if you, if you feel like that you are not a good decision maker, I mean not everybody is a good decision maker, no? I mean in reality not everybody can be a leader, right? otherwise I mean this entire country and then this entire organization will be full of leaders, right? It's not everybody's cup of cake. Right? Um, so if you, if you feel like you are not a good decision maker, don't sign up for like decision making roles. But if you come across an opportunity like that, make sure that you set your expectations right. Because deep within you know there are certain areas that, that are not my strength. So discuss with your supervisors, discuss with, with the organization that you are in. Okay, these are my strengths, these are my values, and uh, this is how I perform. So it's very important that you set, this, set, the, uh, set the expectations so there are no surprises. Knowing where one below belongs and uh, one belongs can transform an ordinary working like a competent person into like a, an outside and outside performer. So it's very important for you to figure out where you actually belong. If you end up in a wrong place uh, in your career, you you will not succeed. What should I contribute? So the. So in the age of the knowledge worker, by the way, the, the, the term knowledge worker is supposedly have been coined by this same gentleman, Peter Drucker, back in the 1950s. What he says is, number one, uh, what does the situation require? Let's say you, 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 are, you, you, are, uh, you are given uh, the responsibility of a new pot, right? brand new pot, new team members. You should ask yourself, uh, now with, with a leadership title, you should ask what does the situation require. Given my strengths, how I perform, what are my values, and uh, what would be my greatest contribution to what needs to be done. Three, what results have to be achieved. Right? However, you need to assess the, your, your success in this exercise. Right? Uh, you need to measure. So define a, about an 18 month period, one and a half, a kind of period and uh, try to make sure that results that, that you are looking are hard to achieve, somewhat stretch goals, right? Res the results should be meaningful and it should make a difference, right? I mean, if, if, the, if, the, if what you are contributing is not meaningful, this is not worth it. And results should be visible and, if possible, measurable as well. So that is, uh, those are your contributions, right? Try to assess your contributions so, so that you know that you are making progress. And the last one, take responsibility for your relationships. Relationships as in working relationships. Uh, managing yourself requires taking responsibility for your relationships. Remember, all your teammates, all your peers, your leads, your supervisors, are as individuals as you are. So all that we discussed here, the strengths, weaknesses, how they perform, how they learn, are equally valid for all those other people, right? So try to respect that fact. Often these budding leaders get that wrong. They, they try to think of these subordinates, think of these peers, think of these leaders as just like them, which is wrong, right? So they have their weaknesses, they have their strengths, right? So play to their strengths. Take responsibility for you, for effective communication throughout an organization because you often you are playing uh, playing alone playing alone. Often you are working in, in a, like a community, a small community. So organizations are not uh, built on force; they are, they are built on trust. That brings me to the conclusion of that segment: managing yourself.